So, uh, what are the Holy Scriptures? The Holy Scriptures are commonly called the Bible, or the books of the Old and New Testament. Other books called the Apocrypha are often included in the Bible. What is the Old Testament? The Old Testament consists of books written by the people of the Old Covenant under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to show God at work in nature and history. What is the New Testament? The New Testament consists of books written by the people of the New Covenant, excuse me, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to set forth the life and teachings of Jesus and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom for all the people. Notice that there's something similar in both those two last two questions. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So these are, uh, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Not necessarily, the Holy Spirit didn't take somebody's hand like a Ouija board and, you know, it's like uh, an aha. This is what uh, the Holy Spirit tells me about God. What is the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is a collection of additional books written by people of the Old Covenant and used in the church. The reason that a lot of um, Bibles don't have those Apocrypha books is that a lot of those are written in Greek instead of Hebrew, and they're not considered, I don't know, as important or as inspired uh, by God. But I mean, God is at work in all times, so God was at work even during the times when those books were written. Uh, why do we call the Holy Scriptures the Word of God? We call them the Word of God because God inspired their human authors and because God still speaks to us through the Bible. How do we understand the meaning of the Bible? We understand the meaning of the Bible by the help of the Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit again, who guides the church in the true interpretation of the Scriptures. So that's what... Uh, in a nutshell, what we believe, that's my presentation. Now we'll move on to something else. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay, so you may already have that. If you will pass those around, there's probably more than enough. <clears throat> These are kind of some timelines that I'm passing around. One more. These are kind of help us. There's one other thing in the prayer book that I want to point out to you. And that is, it's in the ordination vows and I've said it twice because I was ordained as a, as a deacon and then ordained as a priest. And so let's go to the priest part. And let me find it. Let me find it. Let me find it. Oh, that's a bishop. Bishop, priest. So on page 526, page 526. So the bishop asks me, or asks the person to be ordained as either a deacon or uh, will you be loyal to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the church? Or of Christ as this church has received them and will you in accordance with the canons of this church obey your bishop and other ministers who may have authority over you in your work and then I would I answered I am willing and ready to do so and I solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary 
to salvation, and I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine and discipline and worship of the Episcopal Church. So <clears throat> I said, I solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation. Now, what I didn't say and don't believe is that every last word of the Bible is going to save you. Does that make sense? Because there's some things, I mean, things about slavery and, I mean, not every, every little word of the Bible uh, is, is helpful. It, you know, some words are going to be helpful for you and some words aren't. So, <clears throat> let's talk about, so the first five books of the Bible, who can tell me what the first five books of the Bible are? Do you remember the song we're singing? Genesis. Did you ever sing the song? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, James. Okay, so the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in Greek, those five books are called the Pentateuch. In Hebrew, they're called the Torah, or instructions. Now, if you go to a church that is usually considered like a fundamentalist church where they believe that every word of the Bible is is God's word and and so on they're going to tell you that those first five books are the books of Moses that Moses wrote all five of those books and that's just not quite possible and there have been uh, Bible scholars who have looked into those five books, looked at the way they're written and, and how they're written, and they've come up with at least four different authors that can easily be identified. And the first one, and they're called JEDP, and the first one, J, actually stands for, you've probably heard this name for God, Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses, Jehovah. Well, in Latin, there's no, um, yeah, the, the Hebrew name for God is, is, is Yahweh or Yahwist, but there's, they can't do this in Latin, so they came up with Jehovah in Latin. But in Hebrew, it's called uh, Yahweh, or so this author is called a Yahwist or Jehovah. For the Yahwist, God is a whimsical God. God is spontaneous. God stops and smells the roses. Um, this God is in the, the Garden of Eden um, when it says that uh, uh, in the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden story, that God used to walk around and, and visit with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. And so God, you know, was it, God was uh, talking to them, walking with them, talking to them, all kinds of stuff. God would visit them, talk to them. Um, so God had a very personal relationship with people. Um, this, this author uh, wrote in uh, the southern kingdom of Judah during the times of King David and Solomon uh, that you know, King David established Israel and, and it says that there was peace under Solomon and there was a lot of wisdom. They had a lot of time on their hands. So they started to write down some of these stories about God. And then the second uh, author of the Bible is called the Elohist, and this is a name for God, uh, Elohim. And whereas this up here is either Yahweh or Adonai, uh, this is the the capital J O D, God. When you see that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that's usually this word Elohim, and. The, you can tell the difference between these two because for the Elo, the Eloist, this writer, God is to be feared. This is uh, 
Moses asked to see God's face, and God says, if you see my face, you're going to die. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in this little cleft of this rock on this mountain, and then I'm going to pass by, and I'm going to show you my back, but you can't see my face. But the interesting thing is the Yahweh also wrote some things about, uh, about Moses. And when the Yahweh writes, um, uh, he has seen the face of God and his face shines. And we usually hear that story on my favorite Sunday, which, which is, is Transfiguration, since in the Transfiguration story. Usually they take that transfiguration of Jesus and they put that with Moses' shining face. Um, this uh, writer wrote in the northern kingdom of Israel, and if you notice on your timeline, uh, this one that says timeline of Bible history, uh, you notice in 1850, uh, this is uh, 1,850 years before the birth of Christ, Abraham called by God, then you have Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and slavery in Egypt, and then you have Moses in the Exodus from Egypt, uh, period of the Judges, and then notice in uh, about around 1,000 or so, uh, you have uh, King David and Solomon, and then after Solomon died, the kingdom got split apart, and there was a northern kingdom of uh, 10 tribes, and then there was uh, two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, uh, pretty much stayed together. And so, but so their story was more about uh, Jacob's history and about Moses. And whereas this author up here, because it was written during the time of King David and Solomon, uh, God made a covenant with David that says, um, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your offspring and you're going to have uh, somebody on the throne uh, forever and ever and ever. Well, that ever and ever and ever eventually becomes Jesus. But remember that when Moses took the people from Egypt, uh, he took them out into the desert and to a mountain and then he goes up on the mountain and God gives Moses the what does God give Moses on the on the mountain? Ten commandments. The Ten Commandments. And he gives them all the laws. And God says to these people, uh, if you obey me and you follow me, I will be uh, you will be my people and I will be your God. And uh, if you follow my laws, I will bless you for a thousand generations. But if you break my laws, I will curse you for, for generations to come. So th that's kind of a little bit of the difference. Now, the weird thing was, if uh, you look on your timeline, um, and now look on this timeline here. What this one shows you is a timeline of the prophets. But notice, um, almost up to the top here, where I've got two little stars, in uh, seven, about 722, the Assyrians to the north, they come down and they wipe out the northern kingdom. But some of the people from the the northern kingdom, these Elois, they fled south to Judah. And so then they brought their stories with them. So when you, when Bible scholars, they try to look for this Elois, they find little bits and pieces, but only because the Yahweh's uh, from Judah allowed parts of this to be included in their Bible. So in a sense, there was almost two different Bibles that then got put in together. Uh, so some of this story has gotten lost to us. But then uh, look on your timeline, this timeline again. Well, and on the other timeline, uh, on, on this, on the timeline of Bible history, 
it says that 521 that the northern kingdom is conquered by Assyria, but then uh, about 150 years later in 587, the southern kingdom is conquered by Babylon and they're taken into exile. So on this one here, you see all the prophets that prophesied in the northern kingdom and then there's a big space and then those that prophesied in the southern kingdom. And uh, you see there, uh, I've got a little line that says Israel during the exile, Israel after the exile, and uh, for Judah. So <clears throat> we have our third author who's called the Deuteronomist or Deuteronomy is, is Dudo is duo, it's two, so it's like second law. And these are historians or even revisionists. And up in here, especially in the Yahwehs, God has blessed them. God has given them all the blessings in the world. God has promised, you know, that David would have somebody on the throne forever and ever. Down here, God has promised as long as they obey God's laws that um, he will bless them forever and ever. Um, but then they go, they get punished and they go into this, this exile. So this Deuteronomist or these authors say, why did God have to punish us? Why did God have to punish us? Well, it's because they didn't obey the laws. Um, so it helps explain why they had the, the exile. Another thing that the Deuteronomist tried to do was um, they tried to consolidate all of the power into Jerusalem. So before they came along, there were all kinds of holy places uh, around that where they were worshiping God in different places. And uh, so they said, so it would be like if we had a capital, if the United States had a capital in California and they claimed to be just as powerful as Washington, D.C., then there was a capital in uh, Alabama or there was one in Texas, and all of those claim to be just as good as Washington, D.C. What do you think Washington, D.C. would do? They would go and try to uh, take those out. So that's what they did. Is they went in and they destroyed all of those other. So they said, you've got to go to Jerusalem uh, to worship. Then in the exile, they had a problem in that uh, they were like, okay, we're going to be in this exile for a very long period of time, so do we become like the Babylonians, or do we want to keep our own heritage? And do we want to make ourselves different from, from all the other people? So what these priestly writers did is they wrote a lot of Leviticus, where you've got all these weird laws, you, you know, laws about mold and mildew and those kinds of things. So the, these priestly writers, they're the rule makers. Uh, they're also really into the fact that uh, God had promised that Israel would always have a homeland and that God would bless them forever. And they like making lists. And uh, when they were in the exile, they kept hearing this story about called the Enuma Elish. And this is their creation story. And in this creation story, they have multiple gods. And, but they have this one god who's like a dragon god. And it's a mean dragon god. And this mean dragon god wants to defeat all the other gods. But these gods are all wimpy gods, except for one. And his name is Marduk. And uh, so they say to Marduk, Marduk, since you're not a wimpy god, can uh, you go and uh, defeat uh, uh, the, 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 that dragon god is called Tiamat. 
And so can you go and defeat Tiamat? So Mar the god Marduk, um, but Marduk says, okay, to the other gods, okay, I'll go and I'll defeat Tiamat, but then I'll have to be the, the, the head of all the gods. And they said, well, it better, better had to have something than nothing. So uh, Marduk takes on Tiamat and chops, and then when he chops up, defeats her and chops her up, all the little dragon parts become part of creation. Now, isn't that a wonderful creation story? That's terrible it's, and disgusting. It's terrible and disgusting. So, these writers said, well, we don't think that our God would create the earth so disgusting. So, on the... Uh, there was, in the beginning, there was nothing. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and that was the first day. And then God said, let's make plants and put them, or let's divide the sky from the waters and, and all of that stuff, and then that's the second day. And then we're gonna do plants and birds, and that's the third day. So we get from these priestly writers, we get that second, uh, or that the, actually the first uh, uh, creation story in our Bible, then actually it was this, this Yahweh stuff here, they did the Garden of Eden story, and then these did the, the seven day uh, story. And uh, so that kind of set them apart. But these writers were all about how do we separate ourselves and keep our, keep our identity so that if and when we ever get back to our homeland that we don't have to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll still be a people uh, together. So those are kind of the, the, the first writers, some of the major writers of the Old Testament. So I'm skipping over and I'm talking about uh, that now I'm going to talk about the Gospels a little bit. And let's talk about this other, this other timeline here. Notice on this timeline that um, the timeline is down here at the bottom, but where are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Where are they at? What do you see about that timeline? What comes first? These are these are writings of Paul. So uh, one of the first parts of the of the New Testament to be written was Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and then he writes the second letter. Then he like writes to the Galatians. And then he's got this church that uh, in Corinth that he helped form. So he writes a letter to them. And then things don't go well, and he's got to write a second letter to them. And then he also writes to this church in Philippi. He writes to the churches in Rome. And then he writes to Philemon. And then maybe he wrote Colossians and Ephesians. But you notice that the Gospels are way out here. They're written... Uh, considerably uh, farther out and Mark is maybe considered Mark is the first one even though in our Bible how is it in our Bible <clears throat> what's the first gospel in our Bible Matthew. Matthew Matthew Mark Luke and John is because when the people put the New Testament together they believed that uh, Matthew was written first but there's a problem with that, in that Matthew is written in very good Greek. This is a, this is a wonderful uh, Greek writer, but Mark is written in what I like to call redneck Greek. Um, it's not as well written. So if you were going to uh, Hadley, if you were going to 
uh, if you saw somebody, something that somebody had written, and you were going to take parts of that and write your own story with parts of that, do you, wouldn't you want to kind of keep what they had written? And so it would look good. But So what they figured out is that actually the, Mark was written first because it's not in very good Greek. Um, but then uh, Matthew and Luke come after that. So, but biblical scholars are a little um, at odds with each other about the timeline of the Gospels. And the first option is that there were the, these oral traditions, uh, word of mouth, about stories about Jesus. And then there was uh, two actual written sources that came out of that. One of those is the Gospel of Thomas. And you notice how kind of small this is. But this is sayings that Jesus, or sayings, and this is, this is no miracle stories or anything. This is just things that came out of Jesus' mouth. So that's one possible source. Then there's another one that Bible scholars call Q. And Q stands for quell, which just means source. So, but we're going to call it Q. So Mark, uh, or the writer of Mark, he, he has access to this Q source. And he uses Q source and his own information, and he writes the Gospel of Mark. So then, but then Matthew, or the writer of Matthew and Luke, uh, they come about 10 years later. If this was written about 60 to 65 uh, AD, uh, then this is written somewhere about 70 or so, five years later or something like that. So you find a lot of the same stories uh, of Mark that are in Matthew and Luke. But there are stories that are in Matthew that aren't in Mark, and they're not in Luke. So Matthew has another set of stories that he, or Matthew, Matthew has other sets of stories that he puts into his gospel. But Luke has stories, he, Luke has a lot of different parables about the, the Good Samaritan is a parable that's not found in Matthew. Uh, the prodigal son is a parable that's not found in Matthew. So the prodigal son, the Good Samaritan, and some of those stories are in a source that only Luke has hold of. Um, then I put this little checkered line around here because then we have John out here who has, he, this is written yet about 20 years, so this is about 90 AD, and um, He's, he's reading all of this stuff, but he has his own interpretation about who Jesus is. And so he's, he's writing, he's, he's, so you see some of the stories here, but in like different order and so on with that. Um, for example, um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have Jesus cleansing the temple. In all of these stories here, Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and then he goes right into the temple and he, you know, throws everybody out, changes, or, you know, tosses over the money tables and all of that. John has this story, but John puts it almost in the very beginning of his, of his gospel. So Jesus, first time he goes to Jerusalem, he says, hey, I don't like what you're doing. And he throws everybody out and throws the, the over changes the money tables. But yet he goes back uh, like two more years. So he makes three visits or two more visits to the temple after he's already cleansed it. And supposedly this, the cleansing of the temple was one of the things that, that ticked off the Jewish authorities and that's part of why they wanted to crucify him. And then John has his own story up here. Now the second option is that and this is is that Mark didn't have access to the Q story, but so but Matthew and Luke had access to it. So you have Mark is separate from Q, 
And, uh, but Matthew and Luke, they have both Q and Mark, and again, they have their own sources. And then Luke also writes Acts of the Apostles, and then John is out here. So, do you understand that a little bit? Yes, no? Okay, the next thing I want to talk about about the Bible is our understanding, the Anglican and Episcopal understanding of Holy Scripture and the importance of uh, the Bible and Scripture in the church and faith. <clears throat> and back, uh, there was a guy uh, named uh, Richard Hooker. He was not a priest or anything, but it was during the time of Queen Elizabeth I, and he helped to really form uh, the, Angli the Church of England during the time of Queen Elizabeth. And he said that uh, for the Church of England, the Anglican Church is like a three-legged stool, that we have scripture as one leg, we have tradition as another leg, and tradition is everything throughout history that people have written about the Bible. So if you go up into our library, there's a, the, the whole series of about 10 or 12 books of very dead old men uh, who wrote things about the Bible. Uh, and then, so the, the church, uh, they read the Bible, they, they, they see what other people uh, have said throughout church history about the Bible, but then there's this reason part. And what do you think reason uh, means? Go ahead, say it out loud. I know, but like I don't know how to put words. If you, if you, um, if you were reading the Bible, and you were trying to understand the Bible, what, how would you go about doing that? How would you go about understanding the Bible? Pretty simple. You would use your own common sense and your own brain to kind of figure it out. One of the things in the, we say about the Episcopal Church is that you don't have to check your brain at the door Remember that. You write that down. Keep it in your brain. At the Episcopal Church, you don't have to check your brain at the door. Remember when I was talking about fundamental churches and their belief in the Bible? <clears throat> you better, when you walk in the door of their church, you better believe what they believe about the Bible. Or they're going to tell you you better believe what they believe about the Bible. They don't leave any room for your own interpretation about the Bible because they've got it all figured out. But we don't believe that. We believe that we can still continue. You can think. You can think. You can about, have your own thoughts. About the Bible. And another way to look at it is that um, we have Scripture, and we study Scripture, and then we use our reason to put it into practice. So... We, we hear the stories of the Bible and what God is telling us. We study that, and we figure out then how to go out into the world and live the life that the Bible. If we say that the Bible has, it's like an instruction book for us on how to live a life that God wants us to live, and we figure that out, we have to go out and we have to put that into practice. Okay. A couple other things, real quick. What's my time? I don't know, because I didn't know what time you wanted to end. Because you didn't start at six. I've got about, right. So I've got about uh, five minutes or so. Um, I'm going to give you, I think you might have one of these, but. So what this is, is, so. You're going to come to me and you're going to say, Father Allen, I want to buy a Bible, but what 
do you think is the best Bible for me to buy? And I'm going to hand you that piece of paper. And because it's going to tell you just about all information about all the different Bible translations that there are. So there's not one, one Bible. Now, one of the very first Bibles ever written was it were written in English. Let's put it that way. It's the King James Bible. And, and a lot of those, what I call the fundamental churches, they only use the King James Bible, and they say if you're not reading the King James Bible, you're not, not reading, reading the, the right Bible. Bible. <laughs> but there's a problem with the King James Bible in that when it was written, which was about um, during the 1500s, uh, when that was the King James. No, the King James Bible was written in the 1600s because it was under King James. Right. The King 1611. James. 1611 okay they don't they, they only had about a thousand Greek manuscripts and some parts of the Bible they didn't even have in Greek they had it in Latin and so but since 1611 to now they found tens of thousands of manuscripts in Greek and in Hebrew uh, written even as early as 100 years after Jesus died. And so the, our, more, our translations now have all of those in there. If you were to look at, if you were to get a study Bible, like this is the HarperCollins uh, Study Bible, New Revised Standard Version, you look down, let me show you here real quick. Okay, so you see, okay, say for example, um, see where it says G? So it says, let your word be yes, yes, and no, no. Anything more than that comes from the evil one. And then you see G, and then you go down here, and when, where's G? G, or evil. So in all of those manuscripts, some of them say evil one, and some of them say just evil. And so anytime you see down here where you've got these letters, it means that, um, and, or over here, you have that other ancient authorities lack falsely. So this takes into account all of those different uh, manuscripts and what they may or may not have in them. So, and you notice there that some of those, the reading level is um, the King James, it says, was written at a 12th grade level. The New Revised Standard Version is written at like an 8th grade level. And that doesn't mean that it's bad. Um, some of them are just harder to read than others because of the, the, the wording. Then there's some that are like at a 6th grade level. And um, if you like that kind of thing, great. Uh, you can go on to, uh, it's called the Bible Gateway. It's on the computer. And it can, if you, there's a particular word, if you're looking at a Bible passage and a particular word or phrase, you're thinking, no, now that's kind of weird. You can go on this Bible Gateway and you can look at all the, the you know, up to a, 50 different translations and see how that f word or that phrase is put into all of those. So that's just kind of helpful about um, if you're going to get a Bible, uh, what kind of, you know, what, what might be to your liking. Now, me being a priest and a Bible geek, I've got probably 10 different translations of the Bible that, but oftentimes I'll get on the computer because, like I said, I can, I can look it up and I can see what different translations say about it. Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about the Bible is, so you're going to ask me, Father Allen, I want to do a Bible study. How do I go about reading and studying the Bible? So you probably, I know you've got that. So here's one way of... 
of reading the Bible. This is usually done in a group, and it's called an oral tradition. There's some, um, some people call this an African uh, method. Some people say that it came from South America. But so like uh, step one, if you were in a group, is to have each person shares his or her experience in the area of prayer from the oh, women. You really go to step two, um, read, uh, read the passage slowly. One person reads out loud. Then recall the word or phrase that catches your attention. And you call out that word or phrase. And then uh, each person shares it. Then it gets read by another person, and if you have uh, women and men, maybe have uh, somebody from uh, a different gender uh, read it a second time, and then you think about uh, where does this passage touch my life, my community or nation, uh, you know, and so on. Then you read it again a third time, and then you say, how is God uh, so this is step 11. Each person says, uh, how is God calling me to live out this gospel or this, this Bible passage? Uh, here is another um, way of looking at it. You can pass it down to her to, to read and study the Bible. And then there's this thing called you probably already have that too. And then you're going to hear this, if you stick around the church long enough, you're going to hear this phrase, Lectio Divina, which is uh, another way of Bible study. And it's kind of real similar to this one that's called the Oral Tradition. But this one um, is when you're, you're contemplating. So the first part of it is, well, it's asking you to prepare yourself and, you know, to get your, your mind and your brain calmed and ready to read uh, the Bible. Then the Lectio is you read it, uh, you read a Bible passage in, in little, read little chunks. You're not, t you're not trying to read the Bible in a year when you do this. Um, and um, then the, on the back side of that page, you see the second part is meditatio or meditation. You reflect on it. Uh, and then on the oratorio or response, if you're doing it by yourself, you can either talk to yourself about it or if you're a journal, write out uh, what's coming to mind and then just kind of rest or contemplate, sit on it, think about it. So there's uh, some ways to uh, do Bible study, study the Bible for yourself. So that's my segment and I'm sticking to it.